Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsein. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're happy to have with us George Bratt. George is the chairman and founder of Prime Genesis, a global onboarding firm. Uh, they work with executives to help them get fast-tracked as far as to be more successful quicker. Uh, he has written an numerous books, including The New Leader's 100-Day Action Plan, and uh, is a senior contributor to Forbes. And uh, we're looking forward to our conversation today with George. And it's great to have uh, George joining us. And uh, George, I guess, first off, would you just give us a little bit of your background, a little bit of your story? Oh, sure. Uh, born in New York, sales, marketing, general management, at a bunch of very big companies and started my own consulting company 17 years ago, focused on executive onboarding. I can go into excruciating depth on <laughs> any of that if you want, but sure. that would be the thumbnail. Got it. So uh, tell me a little bit, If and I ask this question to most, most every guest that we have on, if, if you were able to go back knowing what you know now uh, with your career and, and uh, consulting with executives uh, worldwide, uh, what advice would you you give yourself as a 22-year-old George? You can't fight the tides, and a rising tide floats all boats. So think even more carefully about the choice of industry, function, geography, because whenever you can get into a rising industry like, you know, however many, 40 years ago, wouldn't it have been nice to have foreseen the internet and technology and all those things? Sure. But if you can, if you can pick the rising industry, if you can pick the rising function, if you can pick the rising geography, things are easier. Yep. So you've you've written a book, and I've got a copy here. I know you you have one too. Uh, the the new leaders hundred day action plan, and uh, one of the quotes in there was uh, from uh, the the uh, CEO at Hydric and Struggles, uh, this was a, a few years ago, he said that 40% from their study that they did, 40% of leaders fail in the first 18 months, that they're either pushed out, fail or quit. Uh, and that was a study of about 20,000 searches that they had conducted. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about that. And, and I know that's one of the reasons that you do what you do is to reduce that risk as far as people failing in, in their careers. Uh, but talk a little bit about that and just uh, what you've found in, in, your, uh, in your work. Well, when the reason I got into this was way, way before I knew that number. We, we, I was uh, with Coca-Cola in Japan. We brought in a new vice president. And we'd spent uh, a fortune on this guy. We'd hired an outrageously expensive executive recruiter. We had to pay this guy a big salary. We had to pay him a signing bonus. We had to buy out his stock options. We had to relocate him and his family and his dog and his <laughs> wine to Japan. So uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and months and months and months. And this guy walks in the door and is greeted with, oh, hi, you're here, fantastic. We're so excited to see you. Oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, we got we to gotta find you an office, and uh, you'll need a computer and uh, Meishi business cards. And I went, uh, are you kidding me? We're the Coca-Cola company. H how are we not more ready for this? And I pulled two people together, and we started doing that better. And, and, and then I did it in Taiwan, and I did it at J.D. Power. And finally, I said, okay, I think there's a real problem here. I didn't know the numbers. Um, but I knew companies were doing this badly and there was a way to help people go into new jobs. And, and the 40% number is real. And over the last uh, 17 years, we've managed to reduce that failure rate from 40% to below 10%. So as, as you think about, um, and I, I know in, in the book you, you mentioned there are basically three questions that people need to ask themselves as they're kind of looking at an opportunity uh, and that as you know, companies are taking a look at a person, 
uh, that uh, can you do the job, which are your strengths? Uh, will you love the job, your motivation? And then thirdly, uh, and I love the way you phrased it, can we tolerate working with you, which is fit? <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's a great way to phrase that, can we tolerate working with you? Uh, talk a little bit about that and, and kind of the, uh, the overall as far as for, for fit, and that's you know, something we, we always tell you know, people that you've got to manage your own career. Nobody else is going to do it for you. So fit is, is meshing of gears. And for the gears to mesh, it's not that this gear is bad and or this gear is bad. It's that they have to they have to match. And so if you're the new leader going in, you need to understand the intersection. And one of the, the frameworks that we developed, and there are tools that go with it, but uh, fit is essentially about culture. And it, it, it's the it's the fit between your preferences, the way you think and do things and the way they think and do things. And some people do these really complicated studies, which are wonderful, but they're complicated and they're hard. And some people say, yeah, it's just the way I feel, which is less complicated, easier, but perhaps not as robust. And we found a middle way uh, with an acronym BRAVE, which is if you look at the way people behave, if you look at the way they relate to each other, if you look at their attitudes, if you look at their real values, not just the values on the wall, but the, the things they're really doing and living, and if you look at the environment, you can get a pretty good feel for what an organization is like, and you can look at your own preferences. And guess what? If all the gears connect, it's going to be easier to fit. And if some of the gears don't connect, it's going to be harder to fit. So as you, as you think about, you know, that first, uh, as somebody comes into an organization, uh, there's already a culture there and that fit, you know, with, with the person coming in. Um, what are, what are some things that, that uh, companies can help, uh, organizations can help that new person coming in to figure out the, the culture quicker and you know, that fit and working together, uh, what are some things that you've seen that have been successful? So let me give you an analogy. Um, you are driving from Ethiopia to Kenya and uh, you get to Moyal, you, you clear your passport, you get back in your car, you're, you're now in Kenya, officially in Kenya. You get in the car, you lock the door, you roll up the windows, you check the mirrors, you put in your seatbelt, you uh, turn the car on, you put it in gear, you put your foot on the gas, it's about to move forward. What is the next thing you must do? Let me, let me dial this up. If you get this wrong, you're going to be dead in 30 seconds. Now you're making me nervous and I can't come up with an answer. I'm stuck. So the answer is, <laughs> the answer is you have to switch sides of the road. Because uh, in Ethiopia, they drive on the right. In Kenya, they drive on the left. Here's the thing. There's no reason in the world you should have known that. Every company drives on different sides of the road in so many different ways. And so people come into new jobs, you're going to have head on collisions unless somebody puts up a sign and says, hey, we do things this way or that way or, or whatever. There's just no way for them to know. So you can't throw people in the deep end. You have to help them. You have to set them up to do work. You have to accommodate their needs. You have to help them learn how to work with others, assimilate their needs, and then you have to help them accelerate. Expecting them to do it on their own is like expecting someone to know to drive on the left in Kenya, which most people don't. So I, I know in your book, and, and I thought it was kind of an interesting, it's a short little piece, but it's it's basically a checklist of things not to do when you get in, in a role. <laughs> and, and I thought, okay, I know I've been in new roles and I probably have done a lot of these things that you said, don't do these things in your first day on the job. Um, talk a little bit about that, of, you know, getting that, that fast started in an organization um, and you have a whole blueprint as far as kind of that first hundred days, but talk a little bit about kind of that first, first week, uh, what people should be thinking about and, and, uh, and navigating. So uh, two ideas. One is you have to converge before you can evolve. If you're coming, you're coming to make a difference. You can't do it in your first week. 
you know, this is back to fit. First thing you gotta do is you gotta get the gears to mesh before you start turning. If you start turning your gear before the other gear goes, you're gonna break the teeth. You're gonna break your teeth. You're gonna break somebody else's teeth. There gonna be a lot of broken teeth and people <laughs> are gonna be unhappy. So first idea is converge before you evolve. You're thinking, I'm not trying to change anything. I'm just trying to learn. Second idea, and, and as, as you said, I've written a gazillion books on this. I can go into excruciating depth. But the second, second idea, which is equally important, is think relationships first. If you walk in, if you walk in pretending to know, they're going to hate you. If you walk in talking about your old company, they're going to hate you. If you walk in pretending to be the boss, they're going to hate you. If you walk in saying, listen, I'm new, help me, oh, then they'll help you. So you're going to be a strong leader going forward, but could you just pause to accelerate, converge before you evolve, and just build the relationships first? This is a, a unique time in our history, and, and definitely leader, leadership uh, has had to pivot as far as how we do things and how we operate. And, uh, you know, one of the questions I was asked by uh, a client the other day is, you know, what what are companies doing during this time to help people get onboarded and to figure out kind of how to navigate this time? Because we don't have, you know, some people, and I've you know, heard stories of executives who've been hired. They did the whole thing virtually and uh, they're starting, but they're not even meeting with their team in person. They're, they're doing things like this. They're, uh, they're uh, doing it by video. Any, any things that you've seen as far as that that's working as far as for, for people that are becoming leaders and companies that are uh, during this time that, that you think would be helpful? Yeah. You, you have to be, you have to be much more deliberate about it. Mm -hmm. And, and what you, can't have what's gone away are, are all the the casual or unexpected interactions you know, Steve Jobs famously when he built uh, Apple's design new Apple's new headquarters he put all the bathrooms by the central corridor so people had to come out from the the edges to meet meet each other and they'd sure. bump into each other and they'd have these casual hey oh by the way did you see it nice to meet you oh catch up you can't do that so you have to manufacture these casual conversations. I mean, if you, if you go back to what I said before, where it's relationships first, if all you're doing is being on Zoom calls with a bunch of other people or Teams calls or whatever they are, where you're just getting down to business and not having the casual conversations, you're not building relationships. So you have to be deliberate about it and schedule 10 minute things. Well, you know, I see you in that meeting. Do you have 15 minutes to give me a perspective on, on anything, you know, anytime today? And then, so the companies that are doing this better, the people that are doing this better are being deliberate about creating casual interactions so people can build relationships. And of course, it's not just onboarding. It, you know, as you said before, if this thing's going to go on for 18 months and we're eight months into it, people need to do that to keep their teams together keep the relationship strong. So uh, it, it's creating opportunities for as close to human interaction as we can get. The first 100 days, if you're coming into an organization that crafting that communication message and, and what are some things people need to be thinking about? Yeah, it, it's, it's really tricky. Um, we push people, as you saw in the book, Get a head start, manage your message, build your team. And part of getting a head start is crafting your hypothetical message, which is most likely wrong mm -hmm. because you don't know what you're doing and you don't know which side of the street to drive on. If you don't craft it, you walk in and you know, you're going to get positioned in people's mind you know, on your first day over your first hundred days. And if you don't, choose how you're going to be positioned, it's random and people will perceive you in any way you want. So you want to choose a positioning. Better to choose a wrong position than no position. So it's a hypothetical message. Because it's wrong, because it's likely wrong or vaguely right, you can't come in and say it. You can't do a button that says, I'm all about customers first because 
people will hate you. <laughs> you came in with it. You didn't converge before you evolved. You don't care about relationships. You just care about telling us what to do. So the executives that get this best craft message. And let's take customers first for because it's the thing that came to mind. They don't say it, but they live it and they ask it. And so on their first day as they come in, their questions to people are, tell me who your customers are. It's their first question. So they're putting it first mm -hmm. without saying customers first. Wow, great. And, and those are your customers. And, and what are we doing well with those customers? And, and what do we need to do to do even better? And how do I help going forward? I mean, I'm new. And as I'm, as I'm figuring out what I need to do, tell me about, they're not asking about the finances. They're not asking about you know, operations or whatever if their message is customers. Right. So one, they're asking about it. Secondly, on their first day, they start living the message. And if they think customers are first, their first day, they get out with the customer. And these days, you can't get out with anybody. So these days, that means a Zoom call or a video call or a Teams call with a customer. It's all optics. But they want people to know, all oh, this person's asking about is customers. This person day one got out with customers. They must thank customers first without ever saying it. So there, there are challenges during this time, but there's also... I think some great opportunity and I just saw a piece and I haven't read it all, but I got it in my inbox this morning, uh, article that you wrote on during this time. And I think the three areas that you talk about the kind of the new COVID rules of working is shape, adapt and reserve the right to play. Can you talk oh, yeah. a little bit about that? It just kind of that, uh, what you meant by in that article. Oh, good for you. Um, so, those are three general strategic postures. Um, if you're shaping, you're choosing to shape the market. Apple shaped the market for iPhones. For, for you know, they didn't call them iPhones. They called them, you know, they didn't call them iPhones, but everybody else thought they were sure. whatever they were. And by shaping that market, they got ahead of the curve and they they've reaped outrageous rewards some would argue deservedly so. So that's shaping, that, that's a choice. Um, adapting is saying, uh, listen, I'm just gonna be a fast follower. I'm gonna wait to see what happens. And at Coca-Cola, we used to do that on new beverages. We didn't, we didn't have a research facility. We had quality control, but we, we, we didn't care about inventing new beverages. We were so big, whenever anybody had a good idea, we'd either steal it and roll it out across the rest of the world or we'd buy them out because we didn't care. Sure. <laughs> we'd run it through our distribution system. We could just crush everybody. We did a lot of guerrilla marketing at Coca-Cola. We did guerrilla marketing, G-O-R-I-L-L-A. Where does the 800 pound gorilla sit? Wherever he wants to. <laughs> we would just outspend anybody. So we were great fast followers. Neither of those will work with COVID because mm. nobody knows you know, as you said, nobody knows if these vaccines are going to hit and this thing's going to be essentially over by April or if we've got another six, 10 months of this thing. So nobody knows. And we all know the world's going to be different, but nobody knows exactly how. So if you guess right and can shape the market, fantastic, but the odds are very small. Second thing is, if you wait to get there and wait to fast follow people, it's going to happen so fast you're not going to be able to follow, you're going to be left behind, which leads to the third choice, which is reserve the right to play, which is essentially buy an option. And that means figure out a couple of likely scenarios and place small bets. I mean, if you're going to be about innovation, make sure you've kept your innovators. If you're going to be about production, make sure you've got the ability to ramp up production. If you're about distribution, make sure your allies are in place. And if you're about customer service, make sure you've got your critical customer service people. You've got the core of it. So invest in the core so you can expand rapidly. So that was the, the premise of that article. Thank you for noting that. Yeah. Well, the the 10% that you said you've, you've taken that number from uh, you know, sixty percent uh, failure to to uh, now you know ninety percent success. Um, what? Or no, 
actually 40 so percent failure away from yeah. 40 percent to 10 right and so now it's 10. what what do you think that 10 percent still is oh uh, well I, I know what it is i i, I just it, it drives me crazy and i take it personally every time we can't do it people fail because of poor fit poor delivery or poor ability to adjust to a change down the road we've we can we can bridge the gap on the delivery we've we've built a whole business around helping these leaders deliver better results faster. We just, we don't let people not deliver. We, we just, we flood the zone. We help them pause and then we help them accelerate. We help them get people aligned around their imperative by day 30. We help get milestones in place and running by day 45. We help them deliver early wins by six months. People we work with, they deliver period. And if they build relationships, they can adjust to changes down the road. So if, if somebody's telling them, hey, just switch countries, switch sides of the road, whatever, they can do that. The thing we can't fix is the, uh, the poor fit on the mishire. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I really think the heart of it is actually the second of the interview questions it's, 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 it's oddly enough, it's, it's not the fit question. It's hard to ask the fit question. You can look at it. It's the motivation question. So I've now started pushing people to ask the motivation question first. I would argue that you and, and your team, the first question you should ask any candidate is why would they want this job? Mm -hmm. And in the first five words, you're going to know if they care more about doing good for others doing things they're good at or doing good for themselves. If they say, oh, I want this job because this company is out to change the world and it's going to hugely impact these people and I want to impact those people. Yes. Or if they say, are you kidding? I've been getting ready for this job my entire life. It leverages all my skills. I'm the perfect candidate for this job. It's about what they're good at. Or if they say, are you kidding? It's a promotion. I, I want to be CEO. I, I want the job. I, it's, it's, it's money. It's good for my family. Then it's all about me. And I'm not, necessarily suggesting one is better than the other sure but if what they're looking for isn't what the company's looking for that's the 10 percent that fails i can't fix that yeah and i didn't set you up for that but that's one of our key assessment tools is around motivation and kind of how people are wired and what energizes them because we all have things we uh we love to do and there's things that we hate to do and there's some things in between that and it's definitely important for people to to know what that is. Um, sure you're on it. Yeah. So I know you've written a lot. Uh, you you write every week. Uh, you're a contributor to uh, Forbes, and you've got uh, got a lot uh, that you you put out every week. But what what books do you recommend uh, of uh, other authors that uh, you you would put on a, a leader's uh, must read list? Okay, it's just bizarre. Uh, War and Peace. Light reading? Yeah, light reading. <laughs> Quick. Because you've got these, you know, different people, different leaders with different motivations. And and one of my, my favorite moments is in one of the early battles, the general's up there, and people come to him and say, Hey, we've broken through on the right. And he says, Yeah, let let let's attack on the right. And then they come and say, We're really under pressure on the left. He goes, Okay, let's retreat on the left. He's, he's leading his army like he's leading a galloping horse. He's not trying to change it too quickly and he's adjusting. Um, but the point is that's just one person. And, and the point of reading something as complex like that is there isn't one answer. It's, it's different leadership styles. The world needs interpersonal leaders, artistic leaders, scientific leaders. One size does not fit all, and and I would urge people to think broadly. Yeah. So outside of work, uh, what do you what do you like to do to recharge? I don't know if you know this, but I've uh, I've written sixteen musicals. Really? Wow! As in book lyrics and music. Wow! So yeah, I, I, didn't know so that. I, I compose and play music. Okay. 
So do you play the piano? Is that your, your main instrument? Or? I, I play the piano. There are five pianos in my house. Wow. So where, where, uh, where are these musicals produced and where, where would uh, somebody be able to see, see those or hear so, those? So one of them got, got, the first one got produced in a local community theater. And the second one was supposed to have its professional debut in Rhode Island last June. Amazingly enough, that got delayed. Um, but I, I would currently expect we'll get the professional debut in June probably bigger regional theaters later that year. You know, look for me, Broadway, Tony Awards, 2023. All right. And that one's, cool. called, that one's called the yachting class. Okay. It's a cross between, uh, it's, it's set in Greece amongst yacht owners. It's a cross between a murder mystery and a love story and a social commentary. And it's hysterical. Great. Well, definitely. It, and that's always one of my favorite questions is asking people what they like to do because you find another side of people that uh, most people don't know. So that's, that's, a, that's great. So um, it, where would somebody find out more about, uh, about you and your work? Uh, what, what's the best way to find out about that? Yeah. So I'm, A, I have a, a, a relatively rare last name, Brat, B-R-A-D-T. B, I'm, outrageously findable. I mean, you, if you literally Google George Bratt, I, I come up and, and you'll find my books. There's, there's actually uh, 10 business books. Um, I'm just actually finishing uh, another one today and we'll finish another one by the end of the year called Influence and Impact. Hmm. And so 10 business books and uh, my Forbes article this moment was, I think my six this morning was my 671st. Wow. So I'm crazy findable. What, uh, what parting advice would you give a leader? It's, it's more hope, a hope than parting advice. What the world really needs at this moment is more other focused leaders. Hmm. And uh, there, was, there was this thing by this teacher, it's just this just brilliant analogy. She took a couple of her classes, I don't know if you saw this, and she took a hallway in the school and she filled it with 50 balloons or 100 balloons or whatever it was. And she wrote each child's name on one of the balloons. And so the, the hallway's filled with these balloons. She said, okay, I want you to go in there and we're gonna time you to see how fast you can find your own balloon. Well, they couldn't do it. You know, it just, they, because they were tripping over each other, it just didn't work. And she said, okay, let's try it again. This time, pick up any balloon and find the person who that balloon belongs to. And everybody had their balloon you know, within minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's the difference between focus on me and focus on others. If we could all just be a little more other focused, we'd all be a little better off. Great, great, uh, great partying. Uh, words and, and definitely uh, encourage people to pick up uh, your books and uh, definitely look forward to seeing uh, and reading your new new book coming out. When will that be out, did you say? So one of them is going to get published. One is the 10th edition, the 10th volume of the New Leaders Playbook, which is essentially a compilation of my Forbes articles. Okay. I don't know why anybody would buy it and read the Forbes articles for free. The other <laughs> one uh, is over there. It's Influence and Impact, and it's uh, being done by Wiley. They're, they're a little slower than I am. So that's uh, look for that in the shelves actually next September. Okay. Got it. Well, thanks, George. Appreciate uh, your, your insights and uh, definitely uh, enjoyed uh, hearing about uh, the other side of your, your life and your, your musicals. And uh, so that was kind of, that was definitely an added bonus. So we'll, we'll check those out too. So, and uh, wish you continued success. Thank you, Andy. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.